Hello and welcome to our ARPC online service. My name is Sun Kun and I'm one of the pastors here. I pray that you and your loved ones are well as we come to the last weekend of the Circuit Breaker. Let's begin uh, this today's service with the Lord's Prayer or the Disciples' Prayer, which Jesus taught his disciples in Matthew chapter 6. And since it is a prayer, I'd like you to watch, to, uh, as you are watching this, to pray along with me as well. Aloud, if you can, or in your heart, depending on where you are watching this. And the children can join in too, if you are watching this along with your parents. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And today, Sister Anita and the music team will be leading us in songs. Hello, everybody. You know, sometimes I wake up wondering, what day of the week is it? Is it the day that I ought to be rolling out of bed and zooming into another office meeting? Oh, oh wait, wait, wait. It's a June school holidays, except that it's in the month of May. Yeah, all sounds awfully confusing, right? And you know what? At times like these, I sometimes long for a simpler life. You know, something that is very childlike, childlike faith, childlike joy, something as simple as Jesus loves me, this I know. So will you join me in singing the song? And by the way, do look out for pictures of what our children's church children have been up to these holidays. tells us to give thanks in all circumstances and honestly that isn't very easy to do especially during this season so what am I thankful for 
Uh, I'm thankful for my regular morning runs, and I've even met a new friend, an Indian security guard who works in one of the condos that I run past. And every morning it's become a habit for me to wave to him and say, good morning. And uh, hopefully in future, I'll get the opportunity to stop by and have a closer chat with him and tell him that Jesus loves him. So I hope that you find something to be thankful for. And uh, in the meantime, let's commit to listen to God's word and to follow him. Matthew 18, verses 1 to 14. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Verse 7. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Verse 10. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? 
And if he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. So it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. Thank you so much, Anita and the music team, for leading us in songs and for reading God's word for us. Did you also enjoy the artwork by the children? And now I ask you to please pay careful attention to this announcement by Pastor Chris. Welcome everyone again to our services and we pray that it will really be a blessing. We come down to the announcements and the announcements are to share with you God's heartbeat for the world. So we are sharing with you today important announcements about ARPC's COVID-19 response. And we're going to respond in three ways by loving Jesus as the Christ, as our Lord, and we'll do that by studying the book of Revelation, then loving the church and loving country. So I'm going to explain each of them in turn. Loving Christ, we're going to study the book of Revelation, the first seven chapters, because we have a lot to learn as we listen to John's vision about Jesus in this book. And he has so much to say about the trials, the tribulations, the pandemics, the pestilence that comes upon the world in God's purposes to accomplish His saving plan for you and me. So seeing with God's eyes, Revelation 1-7. to The sermon series will be on that. And to bless us, don't forget every year we have the church camp. But we thought we'll turn it around for God's service and God's glory by having a virtual church camp and we'll dovetail our Revelation sermon series with the church camp. So in red um, are the talks. June the 12th, Friday night, most likely at 8 p.m., we'll be covering Revelation 2. June 13 on Saturday, most likely in the afternoon at 2 p.m., we'll be covering Revelation 3. And on Sunday, Revelation 4. And please take note, the virtual church camp will have special guests sharing with us testimonies from our own people and we'll have a breakout session on Saturday itself. So with all of this, we're going to help our members. We're going to give the, the allowance to our DGs. Some DGs feel that they are tired and they want to rest. Some DGs want to keep going. So what we are going to do is give you day by day daily devotion questions to guide you through the reading of the book of Revelation for the whole month. And if you choose to carry on with your discipleship groups, please uh, use these questions for your guidance and, and your notes. I hope it's clear. I hope it's exciting because as God's people, we are always to build our lives rooted in His Word and rooted in His love. So flowing from loving, the, loving Christ is loving church. We know that the economic fallout may be very great all across the world and even in our country. And the government has rolled out four special budgets to the tune of almost $100 billion. And so, within the body of Christ, following God's word to us, to that love must begin with the family of God, the household of God. In Galatians 6.10, we have set out an essential relief fund. And this is to address hardship due to COVID-19. It complements the government efforts, which means that some people may not qualify for some of the support schemes that are out there because of um, different factors in their life. And this is where we want to come along as the body of Christ, the family of God, to complement the government efforts, to help members and our regulars. This is open for our members and our regulars and to sustain us, basically to food, put food on the table urgently, importantly, lovingly. So to apply for this, more details are in our bulletin and speak to church leaders, our pastors, pick, speak to your discipleship group leaders because that's where the news is going out and to our ministry leaders and they will point you to an application form. We hope that this will help the people in our midst and the families in our midst. Last but not least is loving our country. And we have heard of the great needs that have surfaced all the way from the elderly to the migrant workers to the foreign workers. And so we thought the best way is for us to be uh, 
partnering, giving firstly, and then partnering in the future. HealthServe, which is a very established Christian NGO, reaching out to migrant workers all these years, mainly in terms of healthcare. And a new one is AGWO that was set up after the celebration of hope is the alliance of uh, workers here in Singapore. And we are going to be thinking of how to partner them by adopting a DOM because there are so many DOMs in Singapore, especially the factory converted DOMs. We'll say more about it in the weeks and the months ahead as we get clearer, as we find out about the needs. So please be informed and please be prayerful and join us. And to help us through all this, please zoom in for two sessions of Ask. And what is this? Jesus to, told us to ask and seek and knock about God and the things of God. And so surely all of us questions about God, faith in God, fear at home, fear at work, at school. What does it mean for me as a single? What does it mean for me as a married person? Please come and pray and chat with me, Pastor Chris, as we transit in the next month, June and July, next months, which are critical months of safe reopening, safe transition and safe nation. And what does it mean for us as a saved people, saved by Christ, to be going out and being a light in this way? So we look forward to seeing you June the 6th, Saturday at 8pm and June the 20th, Saturday at 8pm also. And so our ministries carry on and a uh, Ministry to Men, we are having a few testimonies put together, Pandemic Stories podcast. Look out for them uh, on our website and our Facebook. Last but not least, Dreamy Dream Paths. This is our ministry uh, of culinary arts and we are still blessing people all around as we share these recipes and share the gospel. I hope all these things inform you, excite you to pray along and participate with us in loving Jesus through all times, loving His Church with the Essential Relief Fund and loving our country by partnering people who are out there serving Christ. The Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Chris. Now please take note of the uh, upcoming events in June. It's now time for financial giving. And this financial giving is for our members and regulars to support ARPC's gospel ministry and ministers. So we invite you to pause the screen at this moment to give electronically now or to do so after the service. However, if you are visiting us today uh, online, please do not feel obliged to give at all. We are just thankful for you joining us today. Thank you so much. And now please join me in congregational prayer to God. We'll be using the prayer points that are found on the front page of the bulletin. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, you teach us to make supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way, for this is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Saviour, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So we pray today for our government and the authorities that you've set over us. We pray for our Prime Minister, our Cabinet Ministers, members of Parliament and all who are in public service, that you may grant them wisdom to make good decisions for the nation especially in troubled times like this, we beseech you to watch over them and their families that they may continue to serve unhindered. We pray for your servants who work in the last line of defence in this fight against COVID-19, for our healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, administrators, cleaners, canteen staff. We pray for our unseen enforcers the contact tracers, the police force, the SHN enforcers who are working behind the scene to keep us all safe. And for the civil servants who are crafting and implementing policies for your people. And especially for many of our brothers and sisters in ARPC who are serving in essential services. We pray that you will keep all of them safe and guard them and their families from prejudice against them. 
We pray as well for your comfort upon those who have lost loved ones during this time and for the healing of those who are infected and recovering from COVID-19. We pray for loved ones who are sick and recovering from other illnesses as well. We pray now for the family of Mr. Cheng Chongqing, father of Jennifer Cheng and grandfather of Samuel He, who was caught home to the Lord on 26 May in Cebu. May your comforts rest upon this family during this time of bereavement. We pray for the economic victims of COVID-19, those affected by job losses, businesses closures, and other disruptions. We pray especially for the 300,000 Malaysian workers and many of our backbone services in factories and small businesses, restaurants, con construction and service industries for their safety, accommodation and health. And we, Father, we thank you that as a church, we are also able to provide relief for our brothers and sisters who may come into difficulty during this time. We pray as well for poor nations and persecuted Christians whose plight and suffering would have been exacerbated by COVID-19. We pray for those who have little or no means to protect or provide for themselves in this pandemic. May your people rise up to meet their needs and to share your love with these people. We praise you and rejoice with our brother Ng Keng Chun and sister Victoria with it at the, at the arrival of their second child, Caleb. We pray for your wisdom upon King Chun and Victoria as they bring up their children in your way. Father, as we come to hear your word today, we pray that you will open our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. Teach us your statutes. Make us understand the way of your precepts that we will meditate on your wondrous works. And we ask all this in Jesus' most wonderful name. Amen. Our scripture reading for today will be read by Brother Bang. Verses 15 to 35. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times. Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servant. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him that debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. When his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from their heart.
Thank you so much, Bang, for reading God's Word for us. It's important to keep your Bibles open to Matthew 18 so that you can follow me in God's Word. And uh, there's also a, uh, an outline in the e-bulletin that you might find helpful for following today's sermon. Let me open by asking you, what do people miss most during this circuit breaker? And if the responses of Singaporeans are anything to go by, you might conclude that what we miss most is our bubble tea, right, from the long queues, or perhaps McDonald's, as Pastor Chris confessed to us last week. Well, here we have a heartwarming photo of a nine-year-old boy who has mild autism and sensory issues. He was just breaking down and crying when his mother surprised him with his first McNugget in a month. And as this boy bites into each mouthful of nugget, Adam couldn't help but say repeatedly, thank you, thank you. For others among us, it may be that long-awaited haircut. But you know, the queues have been really long since the reopening, and I couldn't get my usual K cut. So today what I have is a J cut from my wife, June. However, I'm sure that for most of us, what we really are most looking forward to this coming Tuesday is a chance to visit our parents and grandparents again. And for the parents and grandparents, meeting family whom we have not met face to face for two months, right? Although it's only daily with at most two persons from the same household, any face to face time is better than face time. And that is perfectly normal because God created us to be in relationship with Him and with each other as people in community. Now, what about the church, God's community? Do you miss your brothers and sisters in ARPC, fellow members of God's family as well? I pray that you do. We must miss community, especially God's community. And I admit that I really do miss the church gathering, even though I'm an introvert. Right? But there's so much reading and so much uh, things you can do on your own. So I'm really sad to learn that on-site services cannot resume, probably until phase three, which is likely the last quarter of the year. And even then, probably with limitations. It is necessary so that we can keep our community infections low, since churches were identified as a high risk. But meanwhile, in the meantime, we mustn't get so used to online services like this or our Zoom Bible studies, and we fall into the habit of not meeting physically as a church when we finally can do so. We mustn't think that church is non-essential. God has saved us by His Son, to be in community with him and with each other, as children in his family, fellow members of Jesus' community. So Jesus tells us in Matthew 18 what his community, the church, should look like in our relationships. In the outline, you'll see how Jesus' community are to be people of humility, judge concern, holiness and grace. And Jesus will teach us how to see greatness, the little ones, sin, and forgiveness clearly as we relate to each other. Jesus' community is to be humble and striving for holiness. Now, Matthew 18 is often called Jesus' fourth discourse because in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, we see a pattern of narratives and discourses or what Jesus did and what Jesus taught. Matthew 18 is Jesus' final teaching to his disciples before he enters his last phase of ministry in Judea in chapter 19 and until he reaches Jerusalem in chapter 21 and goes to the cross. At this point, Jesus was still in the region of Galilee, likely at Capernaum, where we last saw him. Then in verse 1, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now, this may seem like a sincere question. The disciples are simply asking Jesus, What makes a person great in God's sight? But 
it isn't so innocent because they are really, they've really been jostling for importance and positions of honour, as we'll see later in chapter 20. So the disciples are really asking Jesus this, who among us, who among us is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven when you are enthroned as God's king, the Messiah? Jesus knows this, and so in verse 2, calling to him a child, Jesus put him in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. This child was highlighted by Jesus as a benchmark for greatness in his kingdom. In fact, Jesus says that unless his disciples change and become like them, he would, they wouldn't even have a place in the kingdom, much less get to sit on his left and his right. By this, Jesus isn't saying that all children are automatically saved, or only children will be saved, or that they are in some way sinless. We have three children, and we know this very well. Our youngest, who's only four, she can lie without batting an eyelid. Mommy says, I can watch TV. This is mine. Anyone with a young child or grandchild knows that children needn't be taught how to lie or how to steal. Because we know from Genesis 8, right? The intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. But children do recognize their helplessness and that they are dependent on others for their every daily need, even turning on the light switch so that they can go to the toilet. In the first century, they are of lowly status and despised in society. Such lowliness and humility is the attitude that Jesus is commending. Now, you may recall Jesus' Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, which began with, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the third one goes, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The subjects of God's kingdom are lowly and humble. And this child is Jesus' visual aid or object lesson to his disciples of such humility. And so Jesus tells his disciples to receive or to welcome them in verse 5. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. Now to give you a mental picture of what this great millstone might look like, it is this vertical wheel that is put by a donkey and weighs a couple of tons. It's sure to sink a person fastened to it down to the bottom of the sea where they will get no proper barrier. But Jesus is saying here that God's punishment is worse than this for anyone who causes one of these little ones to sin or to stumble. Now, Jesus isn't merely or mainly talking about children here when he speaks of little ones. Rather, children are used here as models for Jesus' disciples who are the true little ones. And verse 6 will make this clear by calling them one of these little ones who believe in me. Elsewhere in Matthew's Gospel, for example, in chapter 10, verse 42, this little ones always refers to the disciples of Jesus. They are to be lowly and humble towards one another, having a vision of greatness that is contrary to the world. Jesus' community are to be people of humility, seeing kingdom greatness clearly. Next, in verses 7 to 14, they are also called to be people of concern who will be caring for the little ones. Verse 7, Jesus says, Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame 
than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. So here Jesus acknowledges that temptations to sin or stumbling blocks or snares here will surely come. But the one who causes the stumbling isn't excuse. In other words, God's sovereignty doesn't cancel out our human responsibility. Jesus continues to warn those who cause the little ones to stumble. The proud and the arrogant who stumble the lowly and humble shall not go unpunished. And Jesus prescribes a radical remedy here, a complete cutting off of any source of evil, whether it is a hand or a foot or an eye. And we are reminded once again of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, where he says to those who last, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. In other words, take drastic action to amputate anything that might lead us to lust or to greed or to sloth or to anger, whether it's that Netflix account or that uncontrolled internet usage or that magazine subscription. Whereas in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus was talking about personal holiness. Here in Matthew 18, he was speaking of collective holiness the purity of his community. If we see any of these little ones being stumbled, then the church is to take serious action to correct the offending brother or sister. And if we find ourselves stumbling any little ones, we also must take drastic action to deal with our sin, lest God deals with us and we fall under his severe judgment. Now, for those who fear cockroaches like my wife, you know how to take drastic actions if you see one, right? So, my wife can never sleep if there is a cockroach in the home. So, even if it's very late at night, I'll have to arm myself with a newspaper to hunt for the intruder. And until the fellas smashed and flushed down the toilet bowl, there can be no peace for my wife. The church is to do the same with sin because God cares passionately for his little ones. Jesus points to the child again in verse 11. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven their angels always see the, father of my, the, the face of my Father who is in heaven. What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep, and one of them has gone astray. Does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? And if he finds it truly, I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine that never went astray. This parable of the lost sheep, also found in Luke 15, is here used in a different scenario, here by Jesus to make the same point. God cares for every little one who is lost. So we also are not to despise them, but to care for them. For their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. Meaning that angels or God's ministering spirits, servants to care for the church, will always bring the needs of these little ones before God. And that is because in verse 14, it is not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. So Jesus' community is to see these little ones clearly and to be people of concern for their welfare by dealing with any sin that stumbles them, whether it is the sin of a brother or sister or our own. We continue reading from verse 15 that Jesus' community is to see sin seriously 
as a people of holiness. Verse 15 introduces the next scenario. If your brother or sister sins against you. Now, the words against you wasn't found in the earlier Greek manuscripts. So this verses should and may be applied more broadly beyond personal grievances to address any sin in the church. So the commentator Donna Heckner comments on this. The content of the sin is probably left deliberately imprecise so that a broad variety of offences can be included. Presumably, however, given, given the procedure that follows, the type of sin being considered is of a substantial rather than trivial or merely personal nature. In other words, this is not because that brother smells funny or that this sister sings off-key and yet with great gusto. Within the context of Matthew 18, this sin could be referring to pride or hypocrisy or other offences that stumble the body of Christ, especially the weaker ones in our midst. Jesus lays out four steps, a four-step process to address such sin. And the first is private confrontation. If your brother sins, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. This one-to-one -one correction allows for the sinner to be able to brought to repentance without any loss of face. And note how this confrontation isn't necessarily by a leader. It is the personal responsibility of anyone in the church. The goal is always to win the person over for his repentance before God and restoration to body life. The next step comes if he does not listen. Then take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. These witnesses may be there to confirm the validity of the church, the seriousness of it, or to bear testimony before the church later, if necessary. And then if the brother doesn't listen, they are to tell it to the church. If this church is serious enough to warrant a church hearing, then they need to call it. However, I don't think that this necessarily means to call for an extraordinary congregational meeting because otherwise we will have endless meetings. Right? But perhaps this is before the session of elders or some other leaders in the church. The final steps comes if he refuses to listen even to the church, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, an outsider. This last resort is often termed as excommunication. The offending member is treated like an outsider. And this practice may differ from church to church. It could be a suspension of certain membership rights. Right? So maybe in our case, no free communion meal. It could be exclusion from the Lord's Supper. But most people would agree that this is not simply expulsion, with no further con attempt to contact, to counsel, and to reach out to their offending brother or sister. Even in 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul admonishes the church to deliver a certain sexually immoral man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, it is so that his spirits may be saved in the day of the Lord. It's within this context of church discipline that Jesus says in verse 18, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. See, this authority to bind and to loose, the authority he first gave Peter in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus now grants to all disciples as they confront, rebuke, discipline, and if possible, restore the sinner to fellowship. God promises his authority and Jesus' presence in this entire process. We see in these four steps a gradual escalation, and it's a laborious process 
for church discipline. But this highlights for us the extreme concern we are to have for the holiness of Jesus' community, the church, and yet also the compassionate concern for each offending brother or sister. These are careful steps to protect him or her from prejudice as far as possible. But in the end, we mustn't get too distracted by the how or the process of church discipline. For what truly matters is the why or the goal. And the goal is always to gain the brother or the sister, to restore him or her back to fellowship with us through repentance. And this ties in with the overall focus of this entire chapter, especially the parable of the lost sheep, in which the owner goes to great lengths to recover the lost sheep. If it is not the will of the Heavenly Father that one of these little ones, Jesus' disciples, should perish, then we should also treasure each errant brother or sister. We should spare no effort to restore them to Jesus' community. And Jesus' community must see sin and restoration clearly as people of holiness. The final teaching section from verse 21 onwards arises from Peter asking Jesus, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Well, perhaps here Peter's pride has been wounded in the disciples' infighting. He asked now if he should forgive seven times, thinking that this was very generous, since the rabbis prescribed that one should forgive a brother up to three times. But Jesus' reply is this, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy-seven times, which is another way to say, without limits, Jesus' community can't keep count of our forgiving of each other. Jesus then explains why so with the parable of the unforgiving servant in verses 23 onwards. And in this kingdom parable, a king sets out to settle accounts with his servants. One was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents, which in today's terms is perhaps over a billion dollars. This first servant, realizing his helplessness, fell on his knees to plead with the king. Have patience with me, and I'll pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the king released him and forgave him the debt. Now this same servant goes out and immediately meets a fellow servant who owes him a hundred denarii, which is perhaps around $10,000 today. He seizes this man and begins to choke him, demanding to be repaid. The poor servant couldn't help but fall, and he pleads with the same words. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. Perhaps not everything because of his extreme poverty, but maybe he can pay by installments. Well, but this first servant refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. The other servants seeing this were greatly distressed and reported this to their master. And the master re-summoned the first servant and said, You wicked servant, I forgive you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servants as I have mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Jesus delivers the punchline for us for this parable in verse 35. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you don't forgive your brother from your heart. In other words, forgive willingly, just as you have been forgiven freely. Just as we prayed at the beginning of this service from the words of the disciples' prayer taught by Jesus, we are, to for, we are to ask God to forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And Jesus goes on to say this in verse 14. If, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, if you consider the parable, 
God has forgiven us of an impossible and insurmountable debt. So how can we refuse to forgive our brother or sister their debt? Well, not that a hundred denarii is a small sum. There is a lot that you can do with $10,000. So it tells us that forgiveness is still costly. But far greater is the price that God paid in order to forgive our sins. God gave his only son, whom he loved, to gain us. And so as God's forgiven people, Jesus' community, we are to be people of grace, seeing the forgiveness of one another clearly. To recap, all four of Jesus' teaching sections in Matthew 18 address relationships in Jesus' new community, the church. God's kingdom subjects should be people of humility, concern, holiness and grace as jesus teaches us to say to see greatness the little ones sin and forgiveness clearly in our kingdom relationships so now we can and we must have a new vision for greatness for holiness and for restoration as jesus's community in his new vision for greatness jesus shows us that little ones are the greatest in god's kingdom the lowly and humble like little children know their utter worthlessness and dependence and they plead for God's mercy. Out of his pity, the king forgives us our debt at the cost of his only begotten son. But the proud and self-sufficient, the powerful and the influential people of this world will not enter the kingdom until we also become like little children recognizing our helplessness and utter dependence on God's mercy. So brothers and sisters in Christ, friends, how would you un answer the disciples' question? Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To be honest, my natural inclination is to avoid those who always seem to be struggling with their life and faith because it's always easier to hang out with people like me, like myself, or who seem to have it all together in their lives. It seems safer to avoid people who might bother us with their problems. But in the Gospel, Jesus didn't walk away from sinners and troublemakers like us. Instead, he came and he died for us, his enemies, so that we might have peace with God. So how often do we say hi to our brothers and sisters in Christ, our fellow church members in Mandarin ministry or perhaps our deaf and hard of hearing ministry in spite of the very real language barriers? Do I make efforts to interact with the youths who may be slightly more awkward as we all are as youths, right? And I confess that I still am. I mean awkward, not youthful. And how about among the youths yourselves? Who do you hang out with and who do you avoid when you gather? Do I also take time and stoop low to hold a conversation with a young child? Or am I too proud and self-important to do this? Jesus challenges our pride and warns us to cut off any parts of our body that causes us to stumble, lest we are thrown into the eternal fire at God's end-time judgment. Jesus also wants us to take care not to cause the more vulnerable members, the weaker members of God's family, to stumble, lest we come under God's severe punishment. We must not despise one of these little ones. This is a matter of eternal life and death. It is only during this pandemic that people are starting to realize that perhaps the football and movie stars aren't as deserving of their astronomical pace compared to, say, healthcare workers, estate cleaners, uh, security guards, foreign workers, and other frontline workers. And it takes a crisis like COVID-19 for us to get our vision of greatness and worth right. So we must ask Jesus to shake up and to clarify our vision of greatness so that we will have the mind of Christ and we know the hearts of the Father who is in heaven, who does not will that one of these little ones should perish. 
With a renewed vision for greatness and worth, Jesus' community is also to have a new vision for holiness, both personally and collectively as a church. Personally, we must heed Jesus' warning. Woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. So watch out for our pride and arrogance, our disregard for the little ones that causes fellow disciples to stumble. Have we been haughty or arrogant towards another Christian? Take drastic measures to plead God's forgiveness and to seek out the other brother or sister for reconciliation, for confession. And this is not easy to do, which is why Jesus describes it as the cutting off of a hand or a foot or gouging out an eye. That sounds much more painful and less appetizing than the saying, to eat humble pie. Because that's how it is. It is painful. It takes true humility, the swallowing of one's pride, to admit that I've done wrong and to say sorry. But it is better than for me to enter life with one eye or crippled or lame than with two eyes, two hands and two feet to be thrown into the hell of fire. Secondly, Collective holiness starts not with the church leaders, right? so you don't push the buck, but with each one of us as members. Whoever knows of a brother or sister's sin, we are to bring it up to the person. Jesus says, if your brother sins, go and tell him his fault. Now, a word of caution here. First, I think we must pray for wisdom, wisdom to discern between what is truly significant sins that will stumble others and for our personal bias or judgmentalism, in which case may cause us to stumble the brother instead. But if after discernment you think that the sin warrants intervention and confrontation, then Jesus teaches us to do so privately first, safeguarding the reputation of the brother or sister with the goal of winning them back. But if the person remains unrepentant, only then do we then escalate it to more people still with the same goal of rescuing them from God's judgment and restoring them back into fellowship with God's people. This new vision for holiness and community efforts to bring back a lost sheep is in tandem with God's will that none of these little ones should perish. Finally, Jesus' community is granted a new vision for forgiveness and restoration. As God the Father has forgiven us the great debt that we owe him, so we are to forgive one another. Again, this wouldn't be easy because to, to forgive is painful and it often comes at great cost to ourselves. Essentially, in forgiving, we die to our rights. We die to our rights to forgive someone who has sinned against us. And nobody ever said that you'll be cost-free or painless. God shows us this by paying the costly price of his son. And Jesus achieves this by his painful death on the cross. And so he'll say to us, Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Now you may ask this, Must I forgive my brother or sister even if he doesn't truly repent? Now that is a good question. But Jesus tells Peter, I do not say to you, you must forgive your brother seven times, but seventy-seven times. Our willingness to forgive isn't conditional to the other person's repentance. It is a beautiful picture of the gospel if you are willing to forgive as you have been forgiven. And yet, without repentance of the other party, the story remains unfinished. It's like watching a drama series or a movie franchise like the Star Wars saga, but you miss out on the final episode. There'll be a sense of incompletion and unresolved tension. Without repentance, there is no, re there is no restoration of the sinner. There is no reconciliation of brothers and sisters. It remains a very sad picture of broken relationships. The story is also incomplete until we have considered and heeded all of Jesus' teachings in Matthew 18. Even as Jesus teaches us to forgive our Christian brothers and sisters, 
un- our believing spouses, parents, siblings, children and bosses, those who have sinned against us, Jesus also teaches us not to condone but to confront their sins. For example, it would be irresponsible, it would be unloving and plain wrong to ask an abused child or spouse to forgive without first protecting the victim from further harm. In this case, the victim is the little one who has to be treasured and cared for by Jesus' community. If anyone is listening to this and you're suffering silently from domestic abuse, we ask you to do contact the church office or one of the pastors and ask to speak to us confidentially for help. A restraining order may need to be filed for you. You may need to be separated from the perpetrator and any crime may have to be reported to the authorities. But we mustn't assist the perpetrator to sweep his or her actions under the carpet or to cover up domestic abuse and allow it to continue. And if the perpetrator's a believer, then the church also has the responsibility to exercise church discipline with the eventual goal of winning that person back for the salvation of their spirit. In conclusion, brothers and sisters, we see that Jesus' community is to be humble and striving for holiness, both personally and collectively as a church. This holiness involves the confronting of sins in the body of Christ with the goal of restoring sinners. It involves forgiven sinners forgiving each other for reconciled relationships that will glorify God and reflect the gospel of God who reconciles sinners. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I ask again, do you miss one another in ARPC as fellow members of God's family? I pray that we all are, and we are all looking forward to that day when we are finally able to gather physically again, because gathering as a community is so important for our holiness. I know many of us are hoping and waiting for life to get back to normal, but the authorities are warning us to dig in and to prepare for a new normal. We must keep wearing face masks or shields as the circuit breaker comes to an end, and we return to school this Tuesday or resume work in the office gradually until a vaccine is found, tested and administered. We will hear this community slogan in our shopping malls reminding us of the reality of COVID-19. The health of all depends on each of us. It is the same for the Church of Jesus Christ. Until Jesus returns to judge Satan and to make us perfect and sinless, Jesus' community must remember this slogan for the, for the reality of sin. The holiness of all depends on each of us. We have a personal and collective responsibility to confront sin and to pursue holiness in our relationships. And yet the greatest news, the best news, the good news of Jesus, his gospel slogan for us for the eradication of sin is this, the holiness of all depends on one of us. For Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10 says that by God's will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So now Jesus calls for us, for all sinners, to come out of the, of the shadow where we've been hiding and to come into the light of the cross. Christ crucified must be our only boast because it is our only hope. Let us sing our closing song together, Calling All Sinners. What glorious hope we have that Jesus calls each and every one of us. All of our pain, all our dark secrets, and all of our shame, all our pretending, and all of our pride, it's time to come out from where we hide. Calling all sinners to come to this place, this mountain of mercy, this fountain of Without cost, calling all sinners.
fortune or fame. It all counts for nothing, and our only boast is Christ crucified. Our only hope, calling all sinners to come to this place. This mountain of mercy, this fountain of grace, fall on his kindness. Come without cost, calling all sinners, calling all sinners to come to this place, this mountain of mercy, this fountain of grace, call on his kindness, he's born the cost, calling all sinners, calling all sinners. Let us receive the benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip us with everything good that we may do his will, working in us that holiness which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Our online service is over. We thank you for being with us today. Jo do join us again next week as we begin our new series on Revelation. Goodbye and God bless you and your family.